All right, let's talk about another th direct theory related to animal rights, and this one is based on a principle called inherent value. And it's an argument that's um, it's got some elements to it that are going to feel fairly familiar to you because they sort of have these echoes of Kant and Kantianism in the means ends principle. Um, and this argument was given its kind of fullest expression by a philosopher named Tom Reagan, uh, who I think was at the University of North Carolina until he retired recently. Um, but he wrote a book back in the early 80s called Animal Rights or the Case for Animal Rights. Um, and it was a very powerful argument. Um, and he worked from the assumption that Peter Singer was right, that animals and humans are morally equal. They do have uh, equal moral status and uh, it's immoral to and specious to treat them as if they have different moral statuses without being able to identify what the relevant criteria is that would justify that judgment of different moral considerability. But Reagan didn't like the way that Singer went about making his argument. And Singer's argument is based largely on utilitarian principles. And Reagan's concern is that um, when you when you operate from a utilitarian perspective, you're concerned primarily with the collective. In other words, what's the greatest good for the greatest number? And that's kind of your target. That's your measurement of, of moral value and moral worth. And so it's not inconsistent with utilitarian thinking that you might use some of the individuals who make up the collective in ways that aren't good for those individuals, but that are good for the collective. Um, and that could be morally justifiable. And Reagan doesn't like that. Reagan's what, what I don't know, if I haven't been in animal rights circles for a, a few years, but um, the term that used to be used to refer to Reagan was that he was an individualist. In other words, <clears throat> Um, and, and they don't mean that in terms of like the rugged individualism stuff that you hear um, from conservative circles in America. What that term means is that Reagan considers the primary um, component of moral worth to be the individual being, not the collective of beings. And, and it's this approach that allows Reagan to make an, an argument or a case for animal rights that is based on this principle called inherent value, okay? And what he means is this, is that if a being has inherent value, um, that's a being that we have to show some amount of respect to. Um, and when we talk about inherent value, this, this, it might help you to think about, um, I, I think a couple of times I've asked you things like, hey, let's say that um, you had no friends, you had no family, you have nobody depending on you, you don't work, you don't produce anything. Nobody's dependent on you. Nobody likes you. Sorry, that's not true, but we're just working with an assumption. Nobody likes you. Uh, in other words, you have no value to anybody. Um, and the loss of your life would not hurt the world outside of you one bit. Would you still consider it wrong to kill you? And you would probably, I hope, say absolutely, because regardless of whether or not I have value to others, as a provider, as someone who's loved, as someone who loves, I have value to me. And that's inherent value, right? My life is inherently valuable to me and I want it because um, it's, it's valuable to me even if it's not valuable to others. And this sort of has hints of Don Marquis' uh, anti-abortion argument where he says, you know, that, that you have to afford moral status to a fetus because the thing that makes your life valuable which is the prospect of future experiences that you will value, is a thing that that fetus also possesses, right? Even though we might not know what that future looks like, even though we might not even be certain that that future will ever become manifest, you don't know what's gonna to happen to you, but that if you believed uh, tomorrow, that, you, or if tomorrow you came down with some horrible illness that you knew you were gonna die from in a week and that entire week was gonna be spent in unremitting pain, you might wanna die sooner. Um, because your future is not one that you value. But if you think that, hey, you know what, next week something good may happen to me. Maybe I'll see a good television show. Maybe I'll go for a nice walk in the woods, but there's something out there that I value. That's what gives you your inherent value. And Reagan is saying, kind of along the lines of Marquis, kind of along the lines of Immanuel Kant, um, a being that has inherent value is a being that has to have some amount of respect. And that respect the minimal amount of respect is this, and here you really see echoes of Kant. Um, you can't use a being with inherent value as if it's just a tool. 
Um, in other words, you can't use it as just a means to some end. You have to, you have to keep in, always at the forefront of your mind um, that this being has value beyond what its use to you is. And this is where Reagan really departs from Singer, because Singer saying, as a utilitarian, the thing that matters most is the collective. So we may be able to justify using some individual members of the collective to benefit the collective. And Reagan saying, no, that's wrong. You have to consider the individual as the location of moral worth. Um, and like Kant, Reagan says, you can't treat the thing as a, just a tool if it has inherent worth. You've also got to treat it as an end in itself, right? This is, this is what we talked about when we talked about, you know, you go to the store and there's a person who's serving you coffee. Are they just a human coffee machine or do they deserve some amount of respect? Like, thank you. Or looking them in the eye and saying, you know, hey, how are you doing today? Thank you for my coffee. This minimal threshold where you say like, hey, I recognize you're not just a flesh and bone machine. You're actually a human being and you're not just a tool for me to get coffee any more than I'm just a tool for you to collect the salary. We're going to acknowledge each other's um, inherent value. And Reagan's coming at this with regards to animals in the same way. And he says that any being that has inherent value, the value of that individual, um, those, that value and those rights that come along with that value, those are way more important um, than any need to promote the overall good. You can't use the individual um, as a tool to benefit the many. And so you, Singer and Reagan actually, back in I think the 80s or the 90s, they found themselves kind of at loggerheads with one another over a situation that was occurring in the Channel Islands down south. And um, th what had happened was there were some pigs from, I don't even know where they were from, but at some point they were put out on the Channel Islands. And because they weren't native to the Channel Islands, they just started to wreak havoc on that ecosystem and havoc on all these other animals and plants that, because there were no predators for these pigs. And so you had some sort of ecologists that Singer might sort of be more in line with who were saying that, hey, for the benefit of this ecosystem and all of its constituents that depend on this ecosystem on the Channel Islands, we're going to take a bunch of hunters over to the islands and have them start blowing away these pigs. And then here comes a guy like Tom Reagan that says, you can't use those pigs' lives and destroy the pigs to, as a tool to benefit this ecosystem, those pigs and their individual lives have worth and deserve moral consideration. Okay, so this is where Singer and Reagan are kind of parting ways. They're both saying that animals have, we have a direct, um, we have a, a direct obligation to the well-being of animals, and it's an, it's, it's an obligation that, that um, considers the non-human animal to have full moral status, equal moral status with a human being, but they're arriving at this conclusion in very different ways. So for, for, um, Reagan, you know, he would ask the question that we asked, and I've asked you a couple of times, you know, do you have inherent value? You say, yeah, but then what exactly do we mean by inherent value? What is that? And this is how Reagan defined it. And I think this is a fairly compelling definition, and it is useful in a variety of discussions about a variety of issues. Okay, so this is what Reagan says. Inherent value, then, belongs equally to those who are the experiencing subjects of a life. Whether it belongs to others, to rocks and rivers, trees and glaciers, for example, we do not know and may never know, but neither do we need to know if we were to make the case for animal rights. Now this phrase, experiencing subjects of a life, I, I think that's probably going to come up for us again a few times, particularly as we talk about um, um, uh, artificial intelligence, for example. Um, there may be some other conversation that comes up with as well. But I want you to think about what that phrase means. You are an experiencing subject of your life. In other words, you are aware of yourself in the world. Okay, you probably don't think of the world as you. You have a kind of thou art that. Uh, well, that's would actually be the exact wrong phrase here. You have a sense that there's you and there's not you. Like, I'm not you you're you and I'm not you and same thing for me and so I have this sense of that I'm a being in and of the world okay so I'm having this experience of myself in the world but I'm very aware that it's my experience of myself as being part of the world and Reagan says that this is what gives our lives value that I value my experience of myself in and of the world and Reagan says 
we have good reason for believing that there are other non-human animals that also have this kind of experience of themselves as subjects of a life. And so, you know, you, there's a million different examples you could point to, but um, I always think about like the grieving elephants um, and how difficult it would be to make a case that when elephant herds grieve the loss of one of its members, that they're not having an experience of themselves in the world of events that are taking place outside themselves, but that they are also a part of. Um, or, you know, I think about dogs and dogs and how excited they are when they see other dogs, like at a dog park. And it's clear that this dog is having an awareness of itself and you can see it modifying its behavior in response to these other beings that are in the world with it. And so Reagan is saying, this is clearly a value to the dog their experience of their life. They clearly value their lives in addition to valuing the other things. Same thing with the elephants and a whole bunch of other creatures. And this is what allows Reagan to, to again, as oftentimes animal rights activists do, make some pretty controversial arguments, right? So you take a dog and you take a mouse and then you take, you know, the tragic situation where you have a human child that's born, say, without missing huge portions of its brain. And there's, there's no, the, the, the human child is lacking the parts of its brain that would give it any kind of conscious awareness of anything. And Reagan would make the argument that, well, in this case, the dog and perhaps even the mouse have a greater claim to moral status or have a, have a, have a more legitimate claim to greater moral status than the human baby does. And in keeping with Singer, he would say, and to say that the baby that's missing the parts of its brain that gives it any sense of self has a greater moral status simply because it falls into the category of human would be arbitrary and therefore speciest, right? Um, because it's not a relevant criteria for determining the moral status of things. Reagan saying, the, it's inherent value that's the more relevant criteria. Um, if you're interested, you, you can if you search for either Reagan or uh, Singer in Google and you do something like Reagan, Singer, people with disabilities, you'll see there's, there's been tremendous controversy surrounding both of these guys over the years. Most of it highly emotional, but a lot of folks in particularly the disability rights uh, movements, they really have as powerful and angry uh, response to any philosophers, just anybody I've, any group I've ever seen. And it's, it's interesting to, to think about and to consider the claims that those disability rights activists make about the kinds of claims that Singer and Reagan are making. And then to consider alongside that the actual claims and the logic and reasoning processes be behind Singer's and Reagan's arguments, because it, it, it's again, one of these things, like most things, the screaming and shouting that's going on is not capturing the fundamental aspects of the debate. So there's probably a debate to be had here, but it immediately blows up into this hyper ideological, you know, kind of straw man type discussion that nothing really productive happens going forward. Um, I wanted to mention here, this is becoming harder for me to do every year because it seems like there's a branch of uh, ethical philosophy that's really kind of losing its steam and it makes me uh, it's 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 not upsetting is probably the one. It's disappointing to me because I think there's something here. Um, back in the 80s and the 90s, in particular, there was uh, the development um, of a, a branch of philosophic ethics called feminist ethics, and then kind of developing alongside it, and very similar to it, a, a branch of ethics called care ethics. And what was it, and it, these were philosophies that um, they seem to get particularly good traction in environmental philosophy. Um, in a branch of philosophy called ecofeminism, um, and people like Carol Gilligan. Well, I won't get into all the details, but, but these. What I liked about both of these philosophic frameworks is that they seem to provide a way of. They, they, for one, they provide a challenge to traditional ethics, but they also seemed to me to be particularly useful in finding paths down this animal rights debate. Okay, and so I just briefly want to explain to you kind of how this these, these philosophic movements roll. I know you've read the very, very brief explanation in Vaughn about this. Um, 
the ethical theories we've been talking about up to this point, like egoism, utilitarianism, Kantianism, all the stuff we've been talking about, these are ethical frameworks that position as the primary subject of concern the notions of justice and rights and obligations. And these are ethical frameworks that privilege this idea of moral principles and moral rules. So if you think about like utilitarians, there's there's a principle that's at the core of utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number. Or if you think about like the categorical imperative in Kantianism, there's this rule, you know, the, the logical consistency and having rules that don't self-defeat is is, is a really important principle in, in ethics. And all of these ethical systems that we have um, been considering, they, they try to put impartiality kind of at its core, and they say that unless there's some relevant distinction, if there's, unless there's some sort of uh, morally relevant difference between me and you, then in any given situation, what I think is right for me would have to, I would have to regard that as also being um, right for you. Or if it's wrong for me, I'd have to regard it as wrong for you if there's no morally relevant distinction between us. Because I have to be impartial. I don't want to just think about what's good for me, what's good for me and my kind. I want to be impartial and I want to be consistent and I want to be rational. And if you think about all of the ethical frameworks that we've been talking about, they put freedom, individual autonomy, choice, order, all of these are right at the core of this. Now, feminist ethics and care ethics are different. They're, instead of justice and rights, they're going to center um, personal relationships, principles of care, concern for well-beings in particular, particularly the concern of the well-being of those who are kind of close to us in our immediate days. So, so the, the feminist ethics, care ethics, it, one of the assumptions it begins with is that these these hyper abstract ethical theories like egoism and Kantianism that work at this really high lofty level we kind of escape the fact that most of our day to day lives don't take place at these high lofty levels. Most of our day to day lives take place in our homes, they take place in our communities and our workplaces. And so it's within that context that we should really be framing ethics, says the feminist um, and care ethicists. And, they're also beginning with a pretty deep suspicion of moral principles and traditional ethics, and there's a variety of reasons for this, not the least of which is the claim that um, traditional ethics have been dominated by men. Um, and so the principles that come out of traditional ethics are principles that have come out of a, a male-dominated um, study. Now you can take issue with that. That's always hard when we get into those kinds of ad hominem or what we might call a genetic fallacy that where an idea comes from or who the idea originate has some sort of bearing on the validity or the truth or falsity of the idea. That's always kind of dangerous territory to go down. It's unfortunate we're in that place right now as a culture. Um, but instead of, instead of saying that somehow the ideas that we have today that came to us from the past are somehow not worthy of our consideration because of who developed those ideas, um, it would probably be better to say, well, what exactly are those ideas and what are the merits of those ideas? Maybe we'll get into this more, actually we will, when we, if, if we have a chance to look at the ethics of identity politics. Um, fe feminist ethics, care ethics also rejects the idea of impartiality, or at least rejects that it is important, as traditional ethicists say that it is. And again, it's this idea that feminist, eth feminist ethicists say, and care ethicists too, that your primary concern should be those that you are responsible for. Your primary concern should be those people that are in your day-to-day um, -day life and you shouldn't be doing things like what Kant does, which is say like, well, everybody always lied when anybody tell the truth, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and an, a significant difference between care ethics, feminist ethics, and, and traditional ethics is that um, it's, it's going to allow considerably more room for emotion. Um, and not just kind of outright reject it as most traditional ethicists does. And, and I think this is, this last point is, is was a, it was a founding principle of feminist ethics. And I think that this might in part explain some of why it's starting to fall out of favor, at least for the last, I'm going to say six or seven years, maybe longer than that, maybe 10 years, hasn't been getting nearly as much kind of airplay as it was back in the 90s. And that is that, at least in the beginning, um, feminist ethics attempted to privilege what the, it termed feminine virtues. 
Okay, so it, it would sort of set up this kind of binary and it would say like, okay, so what are the, what are the historically, um, what are the virtues that have been historically associated with the masculine? And say like, oh, okay, well, rationality, strength, courage, uh, assertiveness, you know, you come up with your list of sort of stereotypically masculine traits and then they'd say like, okay, well, what are the kinds of traditional traits that are historically associated with the feminine? And then we'd say things like, well, nurturing, compassion, caring, patience, domesticity. And in the beginning of feminist ethics, um, there was the, the, the attempt was, well, we're just going to kind of, we're going to tweak the scales here. So the, the things that we've been associating with the feminine and also at the same time been treating as if they're negatives, we're going to show how these things are actually positives. And so feminist ethics tried to elevate this, the importance of caring and compassion and these virtues that were historically associated with the feminine. Now, this is speculation on my part, just based on what I'm reading, but I think as we've, we've moved into this kind of odd discussion we've been having for the last 10 years about the the nature of gender and sex and whether or not there is such a thing as biological sex or whether or not sex and gender are both 100% um, social constructs. I think as this is as that debate has been happening, it's become sort of thought to be out of favor to talk about any qualities as being inherently feminine or inherently masculine. And and as that conversation has kind of gotten more intense, I think it's probably harder to carry through a coherent narrative in feminist ethics that relies on its history. So I'm saying all of this to you to say that I, I think that there's something there in feminist ethics because it, it's, it seems to provide at least a complementary way of thinking about ethics. It brings in some things that traditional ethics excludes, and I think it could be valuable when you're making decisions, for example, about the ethics of eating, right? Because I can't think of anything that's, that's well, eating is one of the most, if not the most, intimate interactions you have with the world around you. You literally take into your body the things of the world, the, the things that are in the world, and you make it literally into you, right? So there's this kind of symbiotic relationship here. And there's ways of thinking about the ethics of eating, for example, and animals, that you can work, you, you can work through those things from a utilitarian or a Kantian or any of the animal rights activists that I've talked to you about here. But, to, but I also think there's a way that you can work through those kinds of questions and what, by putting care and compassion at the very kind of front end of your ethical consideration. And that's where I think sort of feminist ethics um, it can play a really important role here. So I'm going to run through here a couple of ethical conflicts that I'm going to post up on the, the discussion board. You can engage any of them, all of them, or none of them. Remember, the discussion board is optional. But and the, these conflicts highlight this. I, I tried to pick conflicts that I think uh, highlight this part of ethics that I think is particularly problematic. And that is this, that when we talk about ethics, we tend to talk about it with, using kind of a microscope. We, we look at something and we look at it really super closely and we try to simplify it down, down, down. And I think there's real value in being able to do that. And so we'll do things like the trolley dilemma, uh, or we'll talk about the Google car, or you know, we'll talk about abortion in the way that we talked about it. But the hard part about ethics is when you have rights that conflict and in particular when you have rights that are relevant to the kind of conversation that I've been having with you here about animal rights when these things conflict. So I want you to consider, for example, this. There's a phenomenon that has cropped up in about the last, I think I heard about it in 2005 or 8, so it's been about 15 years now, where companies set up a, a, a system kind of like what you see here on your screen where somebody goes out and they get a gun, a rifle, and they hook it up to a motor and then they hook that motor that can manipulate the gun. It can aim the gun up, down, sideways, and it can um, um, activate the trigger and fire the gun. And they hook this machine that's hooked up to the gun up to a computer that then is hooked up via the internet to an individual's computer who's sitting in their home. And the individual who's sitting at home can use the gun to shoot and kill an animal 
the is the, the, the people who are on site with the rifle, they release it out of a cage and then the person with the gun shoots the animal and then the people on site, they butcher the animal and then they ship the meat back to the person who shot the animal via their computer. And this outraged a lot of animal rights activists at the time. Um, and maybe it still does. I haven't checked to see if, how much of an issue this is now. Maybe you can do that research and educate us. Um, the counterclaim came from people in the disability rights community who said, look, if it's legal for people to go out and hunt a deer on their own and butcher it and take it home and feed their families, and I think you could make an argument that's more ethical than any meat that's gathered by factory farming, then the, dis the disability rights advocate claimed there's no moral significance in having somebody who suffers from a, disabil a mobility disability and is not able to go out and hunt it is perfectly acceptable for them to hunt via the computer. So if you try to ban online hunting, you are unfairly discriminating against the disabled because you are, you're making a category error. You're assuming that because something impacts one type of person, in, or I'm sorry, because you're assuming that somebody who is able-bodied is morally permitted to go out and, and hunt, you're using somebody's status as disabled to deny them that same opportunity. So is that an unfair discrimination against the disabled? Um, I think about this, is, these are always interesting cultural conflicts. Um, if you prohibit baby seal hunting, which strikes me as one of the just brutal, oh, it's brutal, right? You, you go out on the ice to these baby seals that can't get away and then you club them over the head. Well, a lot of people have asked for a banning of that. Same thing with whaling. And the claim is that, well, if you do that, then you're being, you're, you're sort of discriminating against a particular culture, whether it's the Japanese and their history of whaling, or it's the Inuits and their history of baby seal hunting. So is that unfairly discriminating against particular cultures if you prohibit them from engaging in a practice that you, as a member not in that culture, have deemed to be unethical for some reason? Similarly, you know, I've been a part of this crowd in the, in the past of, of wanting to get rid of rodeos. Sorry for any of you folks that live in Fortuna um, and like the rodeo. Um, but I, I used to be involved with a group years, 20 years ago, um, that really tried hard to get rodeos banned because it seemed like it was really unfair to the animals that were being asked to do things um, that I'm pretty sure they didn't like doing. Um, but the claim that was made in response to my position was, well, City Slicker um, from Southern California, uh, you don't get it. And you are discriminating against rural, pe rural people and you don't understand our ways. Um, so I would ask you that question. If you ban these kind of events that are primarily in rural areas, are you discriminating against the people in their traditions and their culture in those areas, okay? And, and I would pose the same thing to you about, this has come up with cockfighting and dogfighting where you have, and this is a particularly sticky issue, like in California where we have immigrants who've come from countries and cultures where cockfighting is perfectly acceptable in their cultures and it's a big deal. And then it, they, they emigrate here to America and this is a practice that offends our sensibilities because of how much suffering is involved on the part of the animals. And you think about like people in the southern part of the United States where dogfighting is actually fairly common. Um, and, and so if we try to put bans on these kinds of activities in the name of animal rights and for the sake of animals, are we being, are we unfairly discriminating against immigrants and people who live in the south? 